People often wonder what space has to offer Earth, besides near-infinite strange new worlds to seek out and explore, but it also offers us a number of clean and abundant energy options for back here at home. Whenever I think about the future, I try to do it in the context of imagining a civilization out there where they have the sort of energy abundance that we would have if we had an unlimited supply of oil and no environmental negatives to burning it, where we could pump and refine it for $10-$20 to $20 a barrel and a gallon of gasoline cost a buck in modern cash. That's a civilization that has cheap transportation, cheap heating and cooling, cheap supplies of fresh water for homes and farming, and cheap fertilizer for those farms. It results in the drop in cost of almost everything, while ensuring more funds are available publicly and privately for other services and projects to benefit humanity in general and raise the standard of living for the individual and family worldwide. This is not a pie in the sky idea, or a thing of the distant future, it's just what happens when you don't have a dwindling supply of oil that also causes environmental issues when we use it. There's a lot of solutions we can contemplate down here on Earth, but the solar system is a much bigger place and also where the Sun is actually at, not here on Earth. And today we'll be talking about ways we can get that clean and super abundant energy we need from space. Our primary focus will be on solar power, particularly power beaming, but there's a few different forms of that like solar thermal, and we also want to contemplate a couple other options like Earth's magnetic field or rotation, or nuclear power, fission and fusion. One thing we won't be doing here is talking too much about price per joule or kilowatt hour. While that's vitally important to deployment, the reality is that trying to price power up on any system that's not even fully prototyped is more than a bit dubious. And more importantly, the space marketplace itself is constantly shifting, and so is the energy marketplace. We also often have arbitrary values getting plugged in by those in favor or against a system in the absence of hard data or even just because it's a round number. Just an example, we had a recent report out saying solar power satellites or SPS would run at 60 cents a kilowatt hour. At the time I'm writing this, the US national average is 19 cents so just over three times as much. It did that by assuming SPS lifetimes of 10 years, whereas the SPS Alpha group usually puts the service lifetime at 30 years, three times as long, and longer if maintenance was possible. Since virtually all the cost is launching the satellite, 30 years would suddenly make it economically viable. It was also assuming rather high launch costs, not what SpaceX is anticipating for a few years down the road let alone if we were trying to move a multi-trillion dollar sector of the economy into space, which would see launch costs drop massively as everything just scaled up. Also while we generally want these devices in higher orbits, which takes more fuel, they need their own method of station keeping, like an ion drive, and obviously have their own power supply, so they do not really need the additional and significant cost of moving from low orbit to higher orbits included in the launch cost. It's rarely a bad idea to be pessimistic about new technology startup costs, but that report is assuming much too high of launch costs and much too low of service lifetimes. And this is always current technology too, which is proper when you're doing a business plan for a startup, but not when you're trying to guess the state of play two generations from now. Trying to determine how much a given power system would cost at least 20-30 to 30 years before it deploys at scale would be like trying to determine how much backing up your computer would cost in nowadays money using available storage from the late 90s, when writable CDs were still all the rage and floppy disks were still common, and memory cost many thousands of times more than now. For my part I think we could make a system like SPS work right now and I was a late convert to the idea maybe 6 or 7 years back. I have a lot of friends and colleagues who work on it and other systems and who also have the job of being critical of them too, and that's only grown since I was elected President of the National Space Society, which is a big advocate of space-based power unsurprisingly. It also means I'm not the most neutral source on the matter, nor am I an economist, but I'll try to present the topic as fairly as I can while in a general advocate role. I want to stress though that neither the advocates nor critics are really a good place to offer concrete numbers on costs and performance at this stage, other than to say the march of time and progress will tend to improve them. 
Though as I often like to note on this sort of topic, it tends to improve their competitors too, and some systems might improve 100% in efficiency and surpass how our current competitor performs, but that same competitor might improve 60% in the meantime and thus still be ahead. Either way, we as consumers and citizens generally benefit, but it can mean that a given up and coming alternative energy or production method can still hit all its goalposts to improve and not become a clearly superior choice simply because one or more of the existing methods also improved in that time, and enough to make a conversion less than tempting. With that caution in mind, we still have lots to be optimistic about in the energy front for space, and as we'll see, that includes pathways other than solar panels there too. Again, looking at launch costs and tempo from the last decade does not paint a clear picture of price that we would see if we were launching dozens of big solar satellites a month, nor does it tell us what the economic environment looks like if we're just launching delicate components and assembling a given power generator in orbit from those and bulk materials like metals or silicon sourced from the moon or asteroids. Or alternatively, if we were bringing in fission or fusion fuel from those sources or a gas giant for non-solar power sources. Many of those systems do have extensive white papers done on them that seek to estimate cost, some more up to date or developed than others if you want to continue your research after today, and I would say almost without exception such papers represent sincere and diligent efforts to be honest in projection but there's a lot of unknowns and unknown unknowns out there. I should also note that there is production of energy in space and then shipping that energy back to Earth, and we should not assume these are always hand in hand. They also have very different key dynamics. For instance, the default system for moving energy back to Earth is typically microwave transmission. Microwaves are easy to convert from electricity and then back into electricity at a relatively low loss rate, and they go through almost anything. The microwaves in your home projecting your Wi-Fi signal and heating your food up in the microwave oven are the same thing and pass harmlessly through virtually everything but are very easy to absorb or reflect with certain materials and equipment. Hence the typical microwave photon in your oven may bounce around inside that oven a million times before it actually gets absorbed, but a photon can bounce around a space like that a billion times a second. I think folks worry about getting cooked by microwaves themselves and don't really understand that we use them because they get absorbed by virtually nothing and easily pass through, compared to say visible light, which is also thousands of times stronger per photon too. So even when a microwave hits a piece of flesh, it isn't doing anything but slightly warming it and less than a random visible light photon would. But a light photon will only heat the surface of food, whereas microwaves are better at getting in deeper precisely because they get absorbed less. It is also very hard to focus beams of any photon into tight spots and harder the bigger the photon's wavelength. Microwaves are many thousands of times higher in wavelength and lower in energy than visible photons. You can build one that could concentrate microwaves very intensely on a spot, much like you can with light, and indeed the microwave equivalent of a laser is called a maser. The thing is, trying to focus one tight enough to hurt people or the local environment rather than move energy, making a death ray, would mean a costly and expensive upgrade to such a beaming system, which would also not be even a little bit covert. Everybody can see your satellites, especially the ones with huge sunlight collectors on them. Indeed one of the bigger objections to these is that they would be naked eye visible and add to light pollution, even though we tend to put them in much higher orbits where they don't get shadowed much by Earth though that adds cost. By default, we tend to think of putting an SPS system at geostationary, which is a hundred times further away than low orbit, and thus thousands of times dimmer to our eyes, but these things are huge mirrors so even there you are going to tend to see them. They also can be in higher and lower orbits, this requires you to be able to switch where you're beaming energy down to but also avoids the issue with geostationary being fairly limited and valuable real estate. So nobody builds them as a secret weapon nor can someone easily hijack one and convert it. It could be done, but it would be a really inefficient and risky way to obtain a fairly weak weapon. Conceptually, it would be like trying to build a compressed gas machine gun by hijacking a Porsche or jet plane, when you could have spent far less time and energy to get your hands on a vastly superior weapon system. I want to get that out of the way because the main objection to power beaming is usually this 
and yet you won't see it come up much in papers on the topic except to clarify why it wouldn't work and isn't a worry. And there are plenty of papers critical of this approach, but not on the weaponization point, usually cost and transmission coordination concerns. Another thing I like to note though is that everything is weaponizable, especially energy, it's just in a case like this, you are better off weaponizing a power satellite by using it to power a weapons factory, or running a normal factory and using the increased prosperity and tax revenue to pay for troops and tanks. But while that's the main method contemplated for moving power to Earth, it isn't the only one and more to the point, it can be used for moving multiple types of power. We picture a sunlight collecting power plant sending it down to Earth, but these could as easily be solar thermal plants or thermal wadis on the moon, or even nuclear fission or fusion reactors. Indeed we often contemplate using micro black holes as a power source, and one orbiting the planet at a distance and beaming energy home might be viewed as a wiser approach, even if a micro black hole would need longer to eat our planet than we have before the sun burns out. So that under known theory, one wouldn't be a threat even if it got lost in the middle of Earth or the sun. Beaming stations also represent a very interesting economic marketplace. One of the things we like about orbital solar power is there's no weather or nighttime up there, so except when your station moves in the planetary shadow for a bit, assuming it even does, you can transmit at full power constantly and to the dark side of Earth or right through bad weather. But your satellite isn't stationary, and while we might be able to target individual houses or yards with their own receivers, we usually assume large receiver fields surfacing a modestly large region like a city or county. Such fields could still serve other purposes too, you can grow crops or pasture in one, and indeed I could make a very good case in colder climates for weaving the receivers into greenhouses since a modest fraction is turning into heat when received and converted back into electricity. Thus you could put a receiver into a structure easily modified to that end which gives it some free warmth and an abundant energy supply for supplemental lighting. This means that a satellite is constantly shifting who it transmits to, as it orbits Earth, and odds are you get a very elaborate and fairly automated auction system. We might have a million of these satellites, each generating 10 megawatts of power and each selling power for 1 hour blocks. That would be 10 trillion watts, which is about half the total power consumption of humanity right now, and just gets auctioned off constantly and works in conjunction with other existing power sources. Prices go up, people build more of them, they go down, people build less, or folks start buying those non-peak supplies to use for marginal purposes. That can include sucking carbon dioxide right out of the air to combine with hydrogen from water into methane, gasoline, or other hydrocarbon fuels, which then become carbon neutral. You'll spend more energy doing that than you'll get out of it, but much like charging a battery, there's a lot of cases where that mobile power supply is very worth the increased cost. It is not the only way to get power down to Earth though, and the most obvious is us bringing it in on space freighters. Nuclear can make folks hesitant, especially when it's being used near Earth, but it's great for interplanetary spaceships or on places like the moon that are already soaked in radiation anyway. I could easily imagine a nuclear fission economy growing in space and using lots of breeder reactors to produce more abundant and handy fuels like plutonium and shipping those back home to Earth. This is even more true if we get fusion working, though a note of caution here, you will hear a lot about helium-3 and the moon, and there's two big caveats that tend to get left out. First, there isn't much helium-3 on the moon, it's exaggerated as a source, and second, it is much harder to fuse than deuterium is, so it's mostly attractive because the aneutronic process of helium-3 fusion allows a much lighter reactor with less shielding and less wear and tear which means it's much more useful for spaceships than down on a planet where shielding mass is cheap and replacement parts are abundant. More importantly, if you've got helium-3 reactors then you've got fusion-powered spacecraft that can fly out fairly quickly to the outer planets where helium-3 is vastly more abundant. See our episode Colonizing Neptune for a more detailed discussion of such an economy and its dynamics. Deuterium is also abundant there and much easier to fuse but critically there is a huge amount of it here on Earth and no reason not to use it first. The overwhelming majority of the normal matter in this universe is hydrogen or helium, and both of their isotopes of deuterium and helium-3 are very common everywhere you go except the inner system and Earth-like planets, 
where helium is rare and hydrogen and deuterium are still abundant but not nearly as much as elsewhere. This is another reason photovoltaics are popular for space, because water is fairly rare near the Sun and most of it's down here on Earth, so your option for cheap and abundant working fluids and coolants for classic heat engines like coal power plants or nuclear reactors is fairly limited, though we'll return to that point in a bit to discuss solar thermal power. It's also a reminder that we are not just interested in power production in space for here on Earth. There's all those future facilities we'd like to make in space, all those spaceships, moon bases, Martian colonies, and even habitats in deep space or on seemingly unlivable worlds like Mercury and Venus. We should also be mindful that in some scenarios it might be easier to transmit power from a planet to space instead of the other way around. We tend to assume we'll use the abundant and renewable solar which is more plentiful and stable in space, but we could have fusion reactors down here that transmitted to low orbital satellites when they were in Earth's shadow. One of the biggest issues with power in space is hauling your equipment up there and maintaining it there, and if it costs you a tenth the price to build and maintain down here then you might find that easier. One big exception is when you start having enough power generation that simply creating and using electricity is producing too much heat for your planet. This is beyond greenhouse gas concerns, which clean energy from space is meant to fix, but which fusion reactors groundside would too. The thing is that such engines are always producing at least half their energy, and typically more, as raw heat in the process of making electricity, so if you're doing that up in space instead, it lets you increase the electricity available on Earth without overheating the planet. Now this is where microwaves are handy because we can reliably pull off much higher rates of microwave to electricity and lower rates of microwaves to heat than we can with any steam engine or turbine. 85% efficiency is very achievable with a rectenna, which is the type of antenna we use for grabbing microwaves. We delved in that process in more detail in our Power Satellites episode way back in 2016 and it remains the same now. The thing is, you only really need to worry about that electricity to heat loss as a maximum cap on your civilization if you're aiming for some trillion person ecumenopolis or planet-wide city. However, the same civilization could simply use space towers to bring electricity down on superconductors or ultra-low resistance wires, and we might do something like that too. An alternative to power satellites is simply sticking your solar panels up above the weather on something like an orbital ring or tethered ring, which keeps them in a spot in the atmosphere safe from space debris issues, or causing space debris issues for that matter, while also giving you a launch platform to space that massively outperforms modern rockets. There are even some extreme engineering methods that can allow physical tether connections to the Moon or Lagrange points, like we discussed in Interplanetary Infrastructure. And while those would be major projects, they are well within the bounds of known science and the construction capability of such a civilization, which circumvents the entire issue of beaming energy to Earth. So too, ships bringing in plutonium or helium-3, or pods going down such space towers, elevators or tethers, all carrying a super dense energy source where even a single modest freighter landing once a month would likely supply the entire planet's energy needs for that period, if not far longer and a ship full of helium-3 crashing is utterly harmless, minus the debris, while fuels like uranium and plutonium are so dense and sturdy that they wouldn't fragment much on re-entry and be fairly easy to recover without much concern if a ship did fall apart during atmospheric entry. Needless to say, you can find them easily with a Geiger counter in any place they might land that is dangerous to humans. And because water is so good at absorbing radiation, any smaller fragments landing in the deep ocean would be relatively harmless and would sink like bricks and get buried in the sediment. You should still retrieve them though, and for entirely non-altruistic reasons, plutonium is very valuable stuff. All in all, I still favor a solar power satellite especially in the near to mid term, but we do have options, and their viability is hard to really assess compared to alternatives. I am sure no one will be shocked when I say I'd like to see trial and pilot projects on all of the above. I don't think we gain much by focusing down on one when we have thousands of enthusiastic scientists and engineers who like to try each of several approaches and enthusiasm is a huge and often underappreciated aspect of productivity in every area of human endeavor but particularly science and engineering. I tend to feel the populace as a whole prefers the multi-pronged and aggressive approach to R&D too, 
which is why I tend to be irritated at circular firing squads in science that emerge when one group wants to get their project funded and beats up on their perceived competition, though that can be a healthy and necessary process too. As an example, there tends to be a focus on photovoltaics these days, and improvements in semiconductors and solar panels justify a lot of that, but you've probably heard of solar thermal towers. This is where we get a bunch of focusing mirrors on the ground that point their light at some central spot that gets heated up and moves water or molten salts around with that heat to generate power. One of the problems with them is that unless you want to open a rotisserie on that site, you've got a problem with birds flying through the concentrating spot and getting themselves extra crispy. You could dome that over, but then you're losing some light to transmission through the dome and of course paying for a big dome. Many other solutions have been suggested for that, but there are no birds in space and there's also no complex supply chains there for making solar panels. Alternatively, there's tons of metal on the moon and it's easily extracted with solar kilns and nothing complex is involved in taking that metal and rolling into big polished sheets which are fairly immune to wear and tear in space. So we could do this with robots, especially since those robots could be controlled remotely from Earth with minimal time lag. Even if you're taking up twice as much space to generate the same amount of power, you're not exactly short of that in the empty void of space or on places like Mercury where there's no concern of dust covering your mirrors or panels. It would also be very easy to design some cleaner or polishing bot that walked around on magnetic legs around such panels or mirrors and went back to its hub to recharge, or even had a wired electric connection which served as a safety tether too. This might be entirely automated or even controlled remotely from groundside facilities here on Earth. And these might be groundside facilities too. One reason we like molten salt on Earth is that it remains a liquid even when very hot and full of energy, rather than turning to steam like hot water does, requiring pipes that can handle a lot of pressure and are prone to rupture. You can store a lot of heat in such molten materials and for a long while, and on airless rocks like the moon we can do this even better inside what we call thermal wadis. This can be as simple as pouring heat into a big natural thermal reservoir by having a lot of metal mirrors focused on it or on a heater attached to molten salts piping that heat in, and back out later for power generation. This can also involve the equivalent of a thermos cup, since there's no air and any container suspended on the moon to minimally touch things around it can only lose heat by radiation and can store it a long time and longer the bigger it is. This is mostly viewed as a way to help keep power at a base on the moon, where its ultra-slow rotation makes it so the lunar day is two weeks long and the lunar night just as long. But while the sun may disappear from the moon's sky for weeks at a time, Earth does not. It's either there all the time, on the side of the moon facing us, where we can send a beam from constantly, be it communication or power, or you're on its metaphorical dark side where we cannot. This is what's tempting about the moon for solar power as it might beam excess energy home to Earth while using the majority for the creation of more of these big metal sheets and rocket fuel to be used for ships in orbit of Earth planning on interplanetary voyages. And saving on rocket fuel we need to make and burn here on Earth, few of which are noted for being terribly eco-friendly either, some by how you mine or refine them and some like aluminum are just energy hogs readily available and easy to mine and make if you have a cheap power source beamed in to run things. Alternatively, you can move a lot of more problematic industries off Earth if you have power, especially if you have good automation. Power made in space can be used for making fuel for space travel or running industries or space stations and habitats. One way to get cleaner energy on Earth is basically just to reduce how much we have to produce here and that includes lowering our demand and strange as it sounds, it might be easier or better to ship metals home not just to Earth orbit but Earth itself in some cases rather than making them here. You don't have to use microwaves for power transmission either, they just tend to be our easiest and most efficient to convert energy back and forth from heat or sunlight into electricity somewhere else. Sometimes you might want to use a visible range laser beam as an alternative, especially if you're trying to send it far away where having a shorter wavelength can allow a tidal focus. We often contemplate them for helping push spaceships along, either by raw radiant pressure of those photons or superheating some propellant to temperatures beyond what any fuel might burn at and thus achieve higher speeds. Or for moving comets in system. A weird quasi-tractor beam can be used on a comet or asteroid by having a power receiver on that ice ball or rock 
and using the received energy to vaporize matter there and propel it out in the direction of your choice like a rocket flame, including in-system toward that beam, which pushes against it but not nearly as much as the matter stream coming off in terms of net momentum. So you can send a simple robot probe there to land, embed itself, or perhaps two probes to the North or South Pole, spread out their receivers, and use that to collect energy and vaporize material to be fired out in the direction you want, which might be out-system too. Interstellar speeds are possible this way, and has something to do with excess power production since you always want to have some production even above your peak needs. This is also a good way to support settlements or outposts far from the Sun. Now I mentioned two probes landing on a comet or asteroid for such a push, and that's because if you are at a pool, you probably keep your receiver constantly visible from your distant power transmitter, but if you start blowing material from just one spot like that, you'll start spinning the asteroid or comet into a wobble or rotation, whereas two points would negate that. But it's a good reminder that while we've been talking about heat engines producing power by moving heat around, the way we originally generated electricity is by using that to spin a dynamo. That's just some spinning object, usually a disc, spinning through a magnet which slows it down and generates electric current in the process, converting that kinetic rotational energy to electricity. These days we generally use an alternator over a dynamo which generates alternating current, dynamos generate direct current incidentally. Spinning an asteroid around to act as a power storage might seem crazy, but you can do that and a lot of rotating habitats, since they rotate to produce spin gravity anyway and through a frictionless vacuum, might subtly alter their spin rate to store or withdraw energy this way. So maybe gravity is higher in the evening by a few percent and lower in the morning by a few percent. Or they might just pump water or some other liquid from their core to exterior to compensate with changing angular momentum but stable gravity. You could actually do this to an entire planet, especially one like Earth with a big magnetosphere, and we discussed doing this before to alter a planet's rotational speed. You spin it faster to shorten the day length or withdraw energy to lengthen the day. Earth's rotational energy is 214 billion, billion, billion joules. So if we were okay with sucking 1% of that energy out over a million year period, we would be getting about 2 billion trillion joules a year out of it which is 68,000 gigawatts of power, 20 times the current power consumption of humanity. I doubt that we'd ever opt for this path, but it is available and you can also restore it later if you want, and many terraforming projects on other planets might pursue this method to get the day length they want. You can also move things around in Earth's magnetosphere this way via electrodynamic tethering, which lets you use a long, thin conductive tether, potentially thousands of miles long, to suck energy from that magnetosphere, or alternatively push up and out from Earth by running power into it in reverse. We contemplate that in the devices known as skyhooks and rotovators, and you can do it with a full space elevator too. I could imagine planets with more eccentric orbits or a north or south hemisphere that had more land but was colder, opting to add rotational energy during one season or orbital phase to store it, and withdraw that to warm them during the other phase. This would be a barely measurable change in rotational energy for an object of that scale too. Obviously one of those options that's fairly far out there and probably never of use on Earth, but it's good to know our options and there's a reason this show is called Science and Futurism after all. You can learn more about power satellites in our episode of that name from 8 years back or over at the National Space Society's website, nss.org and we have discussed most of the topics today in more detail in other episodes, though usually with different focuses, often for developing the moon, settling Mars, or terraforming planets. Our playlist on the future of power and industry also examines many of the options from basic fission and solar through advanced concepts like thorium, fusion, black hole power generation, and even vacuum energy and zero-point energy. For my part, I remain a big fan of solar power satellites and hope our improvements in both solar power and space launch costs will see some prototypes fielded sooner than later, and while it has its challenges and downsides too, like many of the others we looked at today, I think it offers a promising way to meet our rising energy needs in a way that lets us get our power cheaper, safer, and more abundantly than now. And I think it's very proper that our path to a brighter future might involve bringing more sunlight down to Earth. So as we saw today, there are a lot of ways to get power from space, especially for use up in space, 
to let us run a growing orbital and even interplanetary infrastructure and that inevitably raises that big question about how if we could be expanding robustly into space like this, couldn't other orbital civilizations too? And if so, where were all the giant beacons shouting to the great silence? After all, there's abundant power to run beacons so titanic you could hear them galaxies away. In this month's Nebula exclusive, Galactic Beacons, we'll dive in to ask if stellar empires might create beacons and to ask how those would work, what types they are, and why you would or wouldn't make them. Galactic Beacons is out now exclusively on Nebula, our streaming service, where you can also see every regular episode of SFIA a few days early and ad free, as well as our other bonus content, including extended editions of mini episodes, and more Nebula exclusives like last month's episode Crystal Aliens, Topopolis the Eternal River, January's Giant Space Monsters, December's episode The Fermi Paradox, Hermit's Shop the Hypothesis, Ultra Relativistic Spaceships, Dark Stars at the Beginning of Time, Life as an Asteroid Minor, Nomadic Minors on the Moon, Space Freighters, Retro Causality, Orc OR and Free Will, and more. Nebula has tons of great content from an ever-growing community of creators. Using my link in discount, it's available now for just over $2.50 a month, less than the price of the drink or snack you might have been enjoying during the episode. When you sign up at my link, go.nebula.tv slash Isaac Arthur, and use my code, Isaac Arthur, you not only get access to all the great stuff Nebula offers, like Galactic Beacons, you also be directly supporting this show. Again, to see SFIA early, ad free, and with all the exclusive bonus content, go to go.nebula.tv slash Isaac Arthur. So this weekend we'll be having an extra episode on Sunday, April 7th on the Fermi Paradox to ask if the reason why we don't see expanding alien civilizations is because they eat their own colonies in the Chrono Scenarios. After that we'll have a look at defending Earth, be it from asteroids, aliens, AI, astronomical explosions, or just mundane human threats, possibly including rebellious space colonies. Then it'll be time for Sci-Fi Sunday, where we'll be looking at the idea of stargates and parallel devices for bridging between worlds and ask if there's any theories bridging between science and sci-fi there. If you'd like to get alerts when those and other episodes come out, make sure to hit the like, subscribe, and notification buttons. You can also help support the show on Patreon, and if you'd like to donate or help in other ways, you can see those options by visiting our website, IsaacArthur.net. You can also catch all of SFIA's episodes early and ad-free on our streaming service Nebula, along with hours of bonus content like Galactic Beacons at go.nebula.tv/isaacarthur. Thanks for watching and have a great week.